Welcome back. I am just back from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where I spent the last week. I witnessed what seems like the beginning of a revolution happening there. I was honored to interview the future king of Saudi Arabia, His Royal Highness Crown Mohammed, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, on stage at the Kingdom's Future Investment Initiative Conference. During our interview, His Royal Highness sent a message to the Saudi people and the world that he is leading a new vision in Saudi while being interviewed by me. A symbol of freedom in my jacket and pants, not covered up. The country was buzzing about his remarks. You have an incredibly beautiful country. You have the resources. But you are having radical ideas, some might say. Recently, you've announced that you will soon allow women to drive. You are allowing foreign investment in your beautiful country. Why now? What triggered this change in thinking? First of all, I don't want to get out of this topic and discuss politics uh, outside of the scope of today, but I'll uh, just be very brief. Uh, Saudi Arabia has, was not like this uh, prior to 79. Saudi Arabia and in the entire region, uh, you have the awakening project spread after 79 for many reasons. Today is not the right uh, day to discuss them. We were not like this in the past. Uh, we uh, only want to go back to what we were, the moderate uh, uh, Islam that is open to the world world, open to all the religions. <laughs> Seventy percent of the Saudi people are less than 30 years old. And quite frankly, we will not waste 30 years of our lives in dealing with extremist ideas. We will destroy them today. We want to live a normal life, a life that translates our moderate religion, our good uh, customs. We coexist and live with the world and contribute to the development of our country and the world. This is something that there are uh, steps that have taken, uh, we have taken in the past that are clear. I believe that we will eradicate the rest of extremism very soon. So I don't think this is a real challenge because we represent the moderate teachings and principles of Islam. And we have uh, the right. The right is on our side uh, and everything that we deal with. So I don't I don't uh, think that we are concerned. Wow, that was uh, history in the making. My thanks to His Royal Highness Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. President Trump announced $400 billion in new deals at the close of his recent trip uh, to the Mideast, and Saudi Arabia included, as the two countries move to strengthen their relationship. The Crown Prince respects President Trump. They share a common enemy, they both say, and that is Iran. Joining me right now is Ian Bremer, president of the Eurasia Group, author of Superpower, Three Choices for America's Role in the World. And do you think that's accurate? They share that common enemy, Iran? Oh, no question. Uh, and uh, the U.S.-Saudi relationship, which has long been good, has gotten stronger uh, as a, under President Trump. Remember, it's unheard of for an American president to first go to Riyadh before any other country, and, and then, they treated him like a king. And then go to Israel, by Absolutely. the way, Absolutely. back to back, Direct. which was incredible. Direct, Two yeah. weeks ago on this program, Ian, I spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, mm -hmm. and he said the same thing. Listen to this. Mm -hmm. Israel and the key Arab states in the region support what the president has done. You said Israel supports the president. Absolutely. But so do Saudi Arabia. So do the Emirates. And, you know, when Israel and the Arab states agree on something, you know, you should pay attention. I, I think this is a, a historic moment. Is it? Could this be happening? Well, look, there's no question uh, that if you are in one of the Gulf states, uh, you don't have big problems with Israel today the way you used to. It's not your priority. You're most concerned about Iran. You're most concerned about the rise of terrorism in your own backyard. Uh, Israel-Palestine is a long, long forgotten priority. And so they're willing to talk to the Israelis behind the scenes much more than they have before. Netanyahu feels like he's in a very comfortable position. Real quick, can the Saudis get this done? Um, He's facing pushback, actually. So it was so inter interesting. The most important takeaway from your interview there was the fact that the crown prince recognizes that his country, as it is right now, is not sustainable. Mm. And we all want him to succeed. The ambition is kind of staggering and breathtaking. Some of the stuff is great and very long overdue. Uh, but let's be clear, Saudi society is really conservative, and the support that exists internationally for the crown prince 
is a little more uh, consistent than what he has within his own country. Let me move on. Let me ask you about Asia. President Trump is expected to go on his Far East trip a week from today, I guess next Saturday. He's going to Japan, China, uh, Southeast Asia. He did $400 billion in deals with the Mideast when he came back from, from Saudi and, and, and that area. Will he do deals in China? What's most important? Uh, this will be the most important foreign trip of his presidency to date, um, not only because it's a meeting with Xi Jinping, uh, but also because he's heading into Asia with a real crisis, which is the North Korea issue. So, number one, everyone wants to know what Kim Jong-un does or doesn't do while Trump is there. Is he going to test a weapon? Is he going to an ICBM? Is he going to test an wow. H-bomb? I mean, and how do the Americans react to that? Number one, so number one, point. we wow. could really be seeing escalation as a consequence of that. Number two is how much time is Trump going to give China to get something done on North Korea before the U.S. starts moving on U.S.-China trade? By far the most important issue for your viewers. So, I mean, I think that this is a really big one. I just came back from Tokyo. His relationship with Abe is awesome, um, and, and certainly that at the beginning of the trip is going to go very well. The rest of this is going to be a lot harder to orchestrate. Do we, have a, a, do we have a policy with China away from North Korea, or is this basically our policy with China is, what are you doing to rein in North Korea? Our policy with China from day one, if you remember, the, a year ago, people thought there was going to be trade war between the U.S. and China. Um, the, when Trump was willing to take the call from the Taiwanese president, all of that. Then. At, with the Mar-a-Lago visit, things got much better, but they got better predicated not on the charisma between the two men, predicated that there was going to be some support from China on resolving the North Korea issue. Mm. Now, I will tell you, no one believes that either the Chinese can re rein in the North Koreans or that they are willing to push the North Koreans suitably hard, cut well, off all their, their energy. Well, their biggest training partner. I mean, come on. Yeah, but nobody thinks that the Chinese are going to cut off all their energy, potentially risking escalation or even fragmenting the North Korean regime. I so it's, it's a question of time. This is not going to last for four years. At some point, the Chinese will be seen by the Trump administration as having failed on this issue, and then we have a problem with it. All right, we'll be watching that. Sure. Great to get your insights, yeah. as always.